argument that networks admit to a certain kind of heterogeneity, that, there's, that networks aren't just a random field in the world, that there's these clumpiness to them, and that clumpiness is of interest. And so it's one thing to say that, it's another thing entirely to try to figure out what that clumpiness is. And so what I want to do today in, the, in my session, and then um, better in Peter's, is first describe what are this notion of community detection, what are the clusters and networks we're looking for, what kind we're looking for today. Um, on Thursday, is that right? No, on Wednesday, we'll talk about role detection, so it's a different kind of clustering. Um, but today we're going to talk about community detection. And so my job is to introduce you to the what and the why and present some the first part of some work that we think might help you think about what the best practice is. You're going to get, just to give away the story right now, you're going to get the, the final result, if you remember nothing else, is the best practice is to sweep over um, all your parameter space and find the, um, uh, the best network. Problem is, that's really hard to do in a smart way, and that's Peter's solution is to find the answer to do that in a smart way. So that's why we're tag teaming today. Um, but I'm going to give you what would you do off the shelf um, if you just turned on R and clicked find me a community. Um, which one is the right choice? Right? What's the right choice to take? That's where this is going to go. And so the way we do that is we're first going to unpack a little bit theoretically about what a community detection is. What is a co what's the cohesion part of a cohesive group? We're going to then talk about a bit of the history and the rubrics of what's involved in finding communities. And then I'm going to talk about this uh, Monte Carlo design. And in fact, it's eight topologies and 15, um, and nine signal levels over 15 different community detection rooms because I do nothing simple. That's, I can't help but add another set. So the sociologist in me can't help but do a little bit of theory. So I think the notion of cohesion or cohesive group is something that's fundamental to the notion of sociology and the, and the, and the idea of community. So the Mindshaft and Gmailshaft, community and, and um, a market, these kinds of things, this notion of a group in themselves versus for themselves, all of the literature on social capital is really about a collection of people that we're tightly knit with. And this notion of a tight-knit community is something that we want to play, pay attention to. And the basic model we have for health behaviors or really any outcome is this idea that there's these cohesive networks, these groups of people, this bonding capital that you've built with others that leads to a sense of doing something well and being a part of a group. And that leads to some outcome, which then reinforces the set. If you've ever been in a bad company, like team building exercise, this is the model, right? You get up in the morning, you do jumping jacks, you say the Pledge of Allegiance, or the, the company's motto. You, they send you off on a retreat. You stay there for six weeks where you, like, you get to know nobody but each other, right? So this, basically, this is the, also the basic model of cults and social network meetings where we bring you together, cut off the outside, and make sure that you have no other contact except for each other so that you can build these cohesive feelings. That's the basic idea we're dealing with, right? And so what we're trying to do is um, make sense of where this fits. And so it involves an idea of separating out a couple of different things. So you have these cohesive networks, you have these cohesive feelings, and you have these social outcomes and how they feed in on each other. We're not going to talk about the cohesive feelings part, and we're not going to talk about the social outcomes. I really just want to talk about the cohesive networks. So what do we mean by a cohesive network? Um, I really recommend that you take a quick look, if you ever get a chance, at this wonderful paper by Lynn Freeman, where he's talking about the sociological concept of group. And he's really working there with a notion of, of transitivity and groupedness that comes out of um, uh, Mark Granovetter's work. But it, it's a nice summary of where a lot of this work goes. Um, in the history of this work, the, um, there's a bit of jargon to get past. The first is that there's a distinction between, in the literature, between cliques and cohesive groups and communities. Like, these are all jargony words for the same thing. If you're in psychology, they'll talk about cliques. or a lot of education work. They'll talk about cliques. For those of us in this room, often clique means something very specific. It's a subgraph of a network where each person in the network is tied to every other person in that subgraph. So it's a mathematical, mathematically dense density equal to one group. Um, the way we find groups in networks has been a bit ad hoc, right? The intuitive notion of a clique or the intuitive notion of a cohesive group is, um, you know, if you're going to the lunchroom and you see a bunch of kids hanging together. That's a clique. Like, there they are. They recognize each other. If you've ever watched a Mean Girls movie or a bad you know, uh, TV show about high schools, you know what these cliques are. And it seems somewhat obvious from the outside. Um, and what 
analysts have done for years is arguably just use whatever tool they have that's reasonably good at finding something that hangs together. And for a long time, this was um, to use, uh, to borrow some tools from psychology. They use principal component analysis, for example, um, as a way to find groups. Then there was a shift to start, start using um, mathematical graph theory models. So you look for things like k-cores and n-clicks and n-clans, and there's a whole list of these kinds of things. That subfield of finding groups largely fell out of favor because it's ex exceedingly sensitive to data issues. So a little bit of data error, and it falls apart. So it, it doesn't deal with stochastic data well. So then not too long ago, um, the uh, uh, network science and, and physics sort of types got in and they said, well, we know how to solve this problem. This is um, uh, the same kind of problem we have over here in statistical physics. We just run that same model on it and you know, it turns out that it's all in the eigenstructure and we're done. Um, that's not necessarily worked either. Um, and so we're, we've been trying to figure out how to get from the one spot we want to the one spot we need. And the solution that's often the case with these kinds of work is that um, we've developed a whole series of heuristics to get to finding these groups. The problem with these heuristics is they don't all work the same, and so that's what brought us to this process of work here. The piece that we want you to think about is that um, whenever you have a problem where a lot of people are sort of talking past each other and proposing methods, it might be that they're not talking about the same thing. And so it's useful sometimes to really be clear about what we mean by cohesive groups. And for us, um, which means me and Peter and a few other people on this paper, um, we think that there's a really strong distinction between the cohesion side and the group side. And you want to be clear when these things match together. That um, these are actually a, a cross set of two types of problems. One of these problems is a connectivity problem, and the other is a boundary salience problem. And so by boundary salience, we mean that there's a distinction between an us and a them. What um, Craig Rawlings called you know, the power of the we. So we have the we, we understand who we are, in contradistinction to them, right? And so this notion of a boundary salience matters. And if you imagine a world where you have really high boundary salience, that means it's really clear what collective group I belong to. Whereas connectivity is whether or not there's a, a series of ties that link those groups together, right? And so whether or not there's a strong number of, of relations, and I think independent relations that relink folks together. And so these things are, are possibly inter are independent features of a social setting. And so if you think about what a classic market is, a market is a differentiated social structure where there's a strong distinction between buyers and sellers, but also lots of connections between buyers and sellers, right? So the markets only work because buyers are connected to sellers, so you're crossing those sets. And they only work really well if I have the opportunity to buy from lots of different sellers and sellers have the opportunity to sell to lots of different buyers. And so if you have your traditional transactional market, you have lots of different types of people, so it's a differentiated structure, um, but this boundary isn't salient. You try to cross that boundary. On the other hand, we can imagine a world where the boundary salience is really high, right? Um, but we often cross it. So this is what classic roles are, right? So the notion that cops go against robbers. We know the difference between cops and robbers, and rarely, and every once in a while you have bad cops you need to arrest, but by and large, you're trying to make sure that the, 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 the relations go between groups as opposed to within groups. Connectivity, on the other hand, is we can distinguish, we can distinguish between really dense groups where there's lots of opportunity for discussion, and really um, sparse groups where there's not much uh, opportunity for discussion. And it turns out that the notion of cohesion that we're interested in is often conflating these two columns of this bottom cohesive role. We're pretty good at understanding that whatever a cohesive group is, there's lots of activity in it. There's lots of social relations that are tying people together. The main problem is distinguishing whether or not you're dealing with a group that is both um, uh, lots of highly cohesive and, in fact, boundary salient. And that's what we would call a modular group, where there's a distinction not just where the group is internally cohesive, but it's distinct from the other groups around it. And that was ma that's what makes a group a, a, a community as opposed to a cohesive set. Now, it turns out there are good measures of cohesion. I've talked about these in other places. I'm not going to go over it in great detail here, other, best, other than to remind you that a good cohesive group, that the cohesion part comes from this ability to have interdependent links, that you have lots of different routes that pull people together. That allows communication to move quickly, for ideas to circulate, or what have you within the setting. Excuse me. <coughs> so 
Given that, we're going to use the word community to define a modular community. So we're, for the rest of the talk today, when I say the word community, I mean these kinds of things. These, these nodules in a network where you have both high boundary salience and internal, high internal cohesion. So what do those look like? Um, Intuitively, it looks something like this. You have your large community of your network, and there's these clusters that are in. This is the clumpiness that drives the heterogeneity in networks that we tend to care about. And we tend to operationalize that through um, some version of a measurement on the mixing matrix. So a mixing matrix, in general, is an aggregation of your adjacency matrix where you take everybody of a type, you sum up them up across the rows and the columns. So what, every node that's in cluster A, I sum up all their ties here, and I count the number of ties from cluster A to cluster A, from cluster A to cluster B, and so forth. And so that's a mixing matrix. And you can do mixing matrices by attributes, or sex, race, gender, what have you, or you can do them in endogenously, in this case, by whatever we think the, the solution to the community is. And in general, the thing that defines a community is a preponderance of ties within the group compared to the ties without the group. So the within the group is the internal salience, that's the the cohesive part and the fact that there's a few ties between is the boundary part. Now what's interesting about this model, of course, is that what we've done here is that all we've done from this is we've taken the volume of the ties. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that at the end, is the thing that defines this metric is a count. Remember sorting and counting is all as network analysis? Well, in this case, we've counted up the number of ties here. Those could be 11 ties to one person or they could be 11 ties spread all over. So that's a hint saying that there might be more to going on inside of this cell than we're gonna give it credit for right now. But um, for now, just keep that in the back of your head. All right, so if we have this mixing matrix, we need some way to figure out how we measure the preponderance of ties internal to the, on the diagonal there. And they, there's a bunch, a bunch of measures proposed. I'm a sort of network nerd, so I'm happy to talk about the history of these measures. But the one we've sort of, as a field, um, come on to recently is this quality function known as modularity. And what modularity does is it measures the excess number of ties on the diagonal relative to what you would expect by random chance under some model of random chance. And the way this works is that we have the observed number of ties that we're summing inside the parentheses there. And we subtract to that the number of expected ties that we would see under some model. And in this case, it's a configurational model. We have the number of ties from person I to person J. And again, this is the degree of either of those. So we would expect by chance that this is essentially the number of ties they could send, the number of ties they could receive, divided by the number of ties at play. That gives you the expected value under random mixing based on degree. So that's what this is. And then we have this little sort of bugger here called a resolution parameter. And what a resolution parameter is, is it says, how much bigger than chance does this thing have to be before it really starts to matter? So it's a scalar that goes on the amount of bigger than chance than you'd expect it to be. And that says it can be a little bit bigger than chance or a lot bigger than chance. And I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, we can go on to more than if we want. Then you have some house cleaning things. So what this is, is this is just an indicator that says I only count this function if I and J are in the same community, and then I normalize it by the number of ties overall. So that's what these things are. All right, so those are, those are just the housekeeping bits. But what's really important is that um, this thing scales nicely. It scales between zero at one end with essentially a random mixing to one if all the ties were at the end. It can be negative if there are all the ties between groups, so it has some nice features to it. One of the things that separates it from a lot of the earlier measures is that if you have only one group, it goes to zero. And so it, it, it forces a, max, a, a curve between zero and some number bigger than zero. And if you have every group in their own separate group, you're also going to end up at zero, I think. Or, yeah, zero. So in either of these two cases, there's some other number between everybody in one group and everybody in their own group that this thing's going to take a maximum value of. And that's kind of cool, because that means you can optimize for it. I can search for this thing, you're going to get a peak. And back in the early 90s, this was like 
woohoo. Like we won, right? We've been trying to solve the number of clusters problem for years, and all of a sudden we now have a way to reparameterize this difference between expected, um, which we before we called the segregation index, but just by doing a couple of these little housekeeping things, it now has a maximizable peak. It's going to have some peak between zero communities and n communities, and that means we can let the machine decide how many communities are there. I don't have to decide. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. I can go home. The number of clusters problem is solved. But that was before we recognized that that thing existed. That is, we assumed by implication, if you do nothing, this number is one. But it doesn't have to be one. Like that gamma can be any number between zero and infinity, right? So you can think this thing as big as you want it to be. And once you recognize that that number is in fact really there, and you were just assuming by default that it was one, then the number of clusters solution disappeared. So that, that was in fact a false solution. And a lot of those papers in the early 90s so some of which I may or may not have been authors on, um, you know, was wrong, right? It's not the case that the number of communities problem is solved. We have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how many communities are the right number of communities. And at the end of the day, that ends up being one of the hardest problems. So the community detection problem is a difficult problem because you have these two things going on at the same time. You have to figure out which group a person belongs to and how many groups there are in the population. And this is a combinatorics problem, because there are lots and lots of ways to assign people to groups, and lots of possible groups that you could have in the network, right? Now, um, I already said that bit. So because this is a hard problem, in fact, it's a, technically it's an NP hard problem, because there are so many possible permutations of ways to do this, pro to do this, this assignment process, that we, we actually have sort of three versions of this problem. It's not just that we have to figure out which group people belongs to and how many groups that are there, but we need to do it in our lifetime, right? We need to do it quickly um, because we have better things to do. We have to get grants, we have to get tenure, we have to graduate, right? So we need a solution to this problem that's not gonna be look and look and look and look, which has been arguably my solution. The joke in my household is when my wife asks me what I'm doing, I say I'm finding groups, and it's because I'm spending all my time trying to decide between this solution and that solution. Um, you can't really do that. So whenever you have a problem that's too big to solve exactly, you use heuristics. And so the whole field of community detection has turned into this field of my heuristic is better than your heuristic. And my other favorite joke in networks is there's two ways to get famous in this field. You either invent a centrality score or you invent a clustering heuristic, right? And so those are the two things you can do if you want to be a network methodologist. And so everyone has invented their own clustering heuristic. Um, and uh, these are some of the more common ones. We have a paper, Peter and I have a paper that's coming out in Scott's um, uh, handbook recently. Uh, that will be out next year. And in that paper we list, we have a live list of this. Um, uh, there's a PDF that goes to this. It's on my website. And so we're updating this as we go. But there's a list of something like 30 now different clustering analysis. I've just put a few of them up here. Um, I like, we like to sort them into a couple of different families of heuristics. The first one is, um, uh, I thought I had the missing one here. Well, anyway, there's um, uh, these heuristic sort methods, and there's a, a series of which are, we, we like to refer to as agglomerative methods. And what these do is they start with everybody in their own cluster, and they slowly put people, and they build the communities up little by little, where they're trying to make as few mistakes as possible in the building process. So obviously, if you and I have really strong ties with each other, then we put us in the same group, right? The problem is that that very first level many people have many more strong ties than they can be belong to one group. And so when you make that decision, you sort of put yourself down a path. And so a lot of the work that these different methods are doing are trying to figure out essentially how you break those early ties in a smart way. Um, the one that I'm going to point out quickly here because we're going to come back to it quite often is this process called Louvain method. The Louvain method does this model where you start with nodes in their um, own clusters, add them together, and then go back and check every once in a while. So it has this nice process of aggregating and checking. Um, uh, the other set, yeah, there we go. The other sort of way of doing this in general is a divisive optimization. So I can say, let's assume that everyone's in the same group, and I'm going to cut this network apart at its most fragile spot. And so I'm going to say we have us's and them's, and then within the them's, I'm going to cut it again. If you've ever been a history of church sect, it's exactly that. Right? It's you're the more pure than me, and the purest group calves off, and you keep going, and you get finer and finer distinctions, and at some point you have the orthodox from the heterodox, and off you go. Right? So that's 
one way you can do it. It's a, um, the divisive processes have this nice feature that you can find some version of the network space where whatever cut you have, you've optimized modularity on either side. And so it's a really nice process. The, 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 the most common divisive method that's been used recently is Gervon and Newman's edge betweenness. And so it's a centrality score that says, let's find the edge that's carrying the most weight between one side of the network and the other. Remove that edge. And then if you keep doing that iteratively, the network will fall apart where you're sort of repeatedly just removing the weakest link, um, for those of you that remember the old game show. Um, and so the nice thing about it is, is that it tends to, we, you know, intuitively it should, should work well. We'll test that in a minute. Um, the one bad part is it is expensive to do. It's a slow, it's a relatively slow process. Then there's a third set that says either of these direct optimization models suffer from the process of the combinatorics. You have lots of these combinatoric things you have to do over and over again, and those are computationally expensive. So let's instead invent a proxy process on the network that should mirror the cluster function. And so we have a whole series of process, op what I refer to as process optimization models. And in this models, what you're doing is saying that if the network structure is clumpy, some activity on the network structure should also be clumpy. And it might be faster to find that process than it is to do something else. So for example, you could imagine a peer influence process going on in a network, and we would expect that if you had a bunch of random starting points, that people in the same cluster would magically converge on the same spot, because the only thing pulling them together are their ties to each other. So that's a a model that someone in the room um, uh, proposed a few years ago that made it possible to do this kind of process optimization, and that can be very fast. Recently, the kind of models that have worked well for this are label propagation. So what, what's happening in this case is your, um, each node has a, a string that describes it. It passes that string to its neighbor. It's, that its neighbor then adopts the string, and that diffusion process keeps going, and this label propagates through the network. Walk trap, on the other hand, imagines that a, a person is randomly visiting nodes. Just at, at each node, it sort of randomly picks a new edge to walk on. It does it. It keeps going back and forth. The number of times it revisits the same node is a, is a hint to how much clustered structure there is on that set. All right. Oh, there's others. I forgot I had these. Oh, yeah. So the other sort of big family of these um, that I want to talk about just briefly are eigenvector methods. So if the other kinds of direct search or um, uh, process models are difficult, um, there's this whole beautiful basis in mathematics that is really, truly elegant about eigenvectors. And um, if, you have, if you haven't done it yet, as I suspect many of you haven't, um, there's a wonderful paper by Richards and um, oh, Siri, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Tom, um, uh, that came out in Connections um, uh, back in the day on eigenvector, uh, eigenvector methods on networks. And for those of you that, those of us that are not sort of deeply steeped in matrix algebra, it's a brilliant exposition of what eigenvector methods are and why they matter and how they capture networks. But effectively, um, what the eigenvector centralities and these kinds of models are doing are they're taking the, if those of you in psychometrics, they're taking the latent factors, the PCA, right? So they're strongly related to that. But they're also effectively doing this walk trap idea. They're, they're, it's explicating and summarizing a whole series of all possible paths of all possible lengths on the network. And the leading eigenvector carries a lot of that information. So I highly recommend going into those sets. Um, the most recent branch of this research has come out of the stochastic block modeling tradition. And this is really a direct result of ergoms and other kinds of statistical models for networks. It says, if you go back to that mixing matrix idea, that's really just a, um, a logit model. At the end of the day, what I have is some label on the nodes. And those labels predict the likelihood of a tie. And what I want to do is figure out the set of labels that optimize the probability of a tie within group as opposed to between groups. And so if I can find that model, if I can find that set of labels, I've won. And so there's a huge amount of infrastructure that goes into defining what the underlying um, uh, uh, you know, label set is. But the, the beauty of this model, of these models, is that they are formally generative models. The, the underlying stochastic block model, the equation that defines the group set, um, will generate for you a set of networks that match that set. And so it has, the, the, the statisticians like it because it has a bunch of provable aspects and so forth, and it's nice in that sense. The, um, there's a bunch of them now that are out there. The good news is, is that they're there, and it's an active set, and there's a bunch of nice theory about it. The bad part about it is that um, most of these packages aren't well maintained, um, and they no longer work with, uh, with the uh, most recent update of R. 
um, with the exception of a couple. Um, so the block models one works. It is um, exceedingly slow. And the Hergum and the graph tool one, both, um, I can't get them to work. Well, graph tool you can get to work in Python, but you can't get it to work in R. Um, and the Hergum one should work really well, but it hasn't been updated in I don't know when. So there you go. Um, so what you might think, um, if, if this wouldn't be a problem if um, essentially these were all just different ways of saying the same thing. But if you feed um, these tools the same network, with reasonably similar parameters, sort of constraints, and to ask what kind of answer you get out, what you see is you often get a different answer. So this is the exact same network being ran on eight different community detection routines. And you can just look and see that in this case, right, so this cluster on the top and this cluster in the top match. But in this case, this orange cluster got split into two. And across all of these sets, the solutions end up differing. And if you go across all of them, and ask how often are pairs of nodes put in the same net in the same set, you figure out that it's kind of a mess, right? There's a, almost a complete network here, um, where even these nodes are put together in the same cluster at least once, right? And so it's really easy to um, run these models off the shelf. And if you look at it, because we're all very good pattern recognizers, right? I can squint at any of these solutions in isolation and say, yeah, that looks fine. It makes perfect sense. Um, but then you compare it to the one next to it, and you go, huh, maybe that was a better choice. And so what we'd like to do is find a principled way um, to distinguish between um, one of these choices or the other. And if we can't find a principled way, we'd at least like to find a good practical way to do it. So, so what do you do? Um, so what we do, um, just like I did with the missing data paper, is we go through and um, we make it up the data. <laughs> we say, let's... Let's simulate a bunch of things and figure out which solution works right. Now, unlike the missing data, um, here it's a little, there's a, a bit of a challenge because what I, my own instinct is I would really like to go out and find a bunch of real life networks and do this model on that. But I don't know the true groups on the real life network, right? And so you end up with this bootstrapping problem that you have no truth to compare to. And so our plan with this set of papers, and this is just a warning to Tom that he's going to get a set of these papers from us again, um, uh, is that we're going to start with the foundation and say, let's feed the network, um, the, the algorithms, something where we really know the truth. We know what the right solution should be. But we haven't made the solution so painfully obvious that any, that any algorithm will win. And so we can scale between reasonably obvious they're pretty <laughs> conflated, but yet still know what the truth is and figure out which of these methods can best uncover the truth. And so that's what our goal is. And we're going to do that then um, with a couple of other hints to the design. And so the first one is we want these networks to be reasonably large, but of the same size that sociologists and social scientists typically use. So we're shooting for somewhere between 500 and 1,000 nodes. We want them to have a realistic complex structure. With that, for us, what this means in this first set is that the networks have a nested structure. And so you can imagine professors in, in departments, in divisions, in universities, right? So there's a nested structure to the data. And that these clusters differ wildly in size, so they're not exactly the same. And the extent to which there's between and within group contact differs across these sets. Moreover, we want them to differ in their degree distributions. And so some of the networks have a normal degree distribution. Other the networks have a skewed degree distribution, but we make sure we understand that. And we recognize, building on Freeman, that there's more to a network than just that sum of the mixing matrix. That things like reciprocity, transitivity, closed loops should be higher within group than between group. And we can use those to weight the ties and think about how um, uh, strong or how group-like this relationship is. So at the end of the day, we end up with four topologies, which I'll explain in a second, um, uh, two different degree distributions on each of those topologies, nine levels of noise, and we simulate 100 networks in each setting. And this implies about 7,200 settings, of which we run 15 different community detection algorithms on each set to get us about 108,000 different solutions here. This is, I told you, I don't ever make anything simpler um, when I'm done. Um, so what are our topologies? So do we have um, four basic topologies. Um, the first one, there are actually two of them like this. And so the basic design is this nested structure. So of your whole, this is, this is an image matrix of a mixing matrix. So each of these rows and columns is a group, it's a community. Um, but in there, which we have is a community nested in a crowd, nested in a group. 
um, and, the, uh, and nested within a graph. And within each of these groups, there are these false communities. And these false communities are just noise. And so we, this is reflecting the fact that we think in most real life settings, there are, that the world isn't mutually divided up into exhaustive groups. But there are people who are just on the edges of the social structure who are kind of hanging out there and making a mess of things. Um, and so the, the top one differs a little bit and then we have both what we call a double nested set and a weak core set. And the way they differ is that we assume that of the total number of, of five ties that each person sends, they could send those to their own community, some level to the group, some level to the crowd, some level to the graph as a, as a whole. So this is the strong to weak signal. Um, and then if they, as this becomes weak, they either redistribute those ties, and so this, the sum stays the same, or they just don't send as much to their own tie, but this, the periphery gets bigger. So those are effectively the same structure, but whether or not you're focusing, you're redistributing your ties or focusing them on the set. The other two topologies are substantively more, a little more interesting and a little more complex. So the first one we refer to creatively as different sizes. So within each of these larger um, groups, we have a, um, so larger crowds, excuse me, we have a, a community that is at least three times larger than the average size in the other. So there's one big group and a bunch of little ones. And so the idea here is a lot of these methods um, have a bias towards same size groups, and we want to push that bias a bit. And then finally, in the other, we say, let's make this hidden sort of false group actually the majority. And we're going to just hide some real groups in a forest of noise and see if the, if the method can pick it up. Oh, I just said that. Um, so this is just give you a sense of what these kind of networks look like. So this is a, an example where there's really strong signal to noise. And so it's really easy. You can see the groups just sort of pop out. But there's still a fair amount of noise there. But then when you pop this thing up to a little bit more noise, it's a little, it's just messier. So you end up seeing that there's you know, a lot of cross-group ties. And the orange ties here are reciprocated, and that's going to add to the weight of this network. Um, this is another example of what the weak core one looks like. And this is what the, the different size groups, when I say that, so you can see that even when there's a strong signal situation, you end up with these really big clusters that are kind of dominating the network, but there's also three or four little clusters within the same set. Um, let me find the one. So this is the, the one that's a little bit harder to see, but the, uh, uh, it's the hidden community idea. And so this is arguably the, amongst the more challenging of the sets, or at least we thought it would be the most challenging. In the signal, in the high signal case, you can see the cluster is there, but there's all of the, the majority of nodes in the networks don't really belong to a group. So they're, they're out there sort of just add noise in the outside. When you get to the, the noisy version of this topology, the group is still embedded in there, but there's just a lot of noise that it has to pick out. So what methods are we going to work on? We're going to work on um, these three different types, so metric optimization, eigenbase methods, and process optimization. The metric optimizations, we have these six different methods. It looks like there are eight different methods, excuse me. A couple of them are repeated, so I want to be clear what we have here. So um, the, uh, the, the uh, Leiden method, um, we have two versions of that. We have a version, for all the methods, we do at least one version, which is just what a naive user would use if they opened the tool, read the description, and picked it and ran. So this is what 90% of analysts do when they're dealing with something. And so, for example, we have the Leiden modularity, and we take the default resolution parameter, and we just run it, and just run it you know, one time. We also have a modularity sweep version, which says we do this thing a bunch of times from a low value of this to a high value of this. And we try to find the one that works the best. We do a couple of different versions. There's a constant POTS model, which runs on density. And we could do one that's also a sweep. Um, spin glass has a default set. Edge between us has a default set, and so forth. Um, so those are run on that set. These um, eigenbase methods, we have a leading eigenvector model. And we also have a spectral um, uh, uh, stochastic block model. The version with the, the thing about this stochastic block model is you have to pick the number of clusters that you tell the group to do. Now, on the one hand, I know the number of clusters in the network, so I could help it along that way. But we're trying to figure out what we think a user would do. And so what we tried to do is pick the number of groups which is equal to the average number of groups that the other solution found. So let's just give it that kind of process and see what happens. 
Um, the other groups sort of finding algorithms um, uh, are these process optimization methods. So label proposition, info map, walk track, um, and fluid community. Um, we end up running, it, it turns out that this new fluid community method is so fast, we went ahead and did a sweep anyway. So we searched from three groups to 30 groups across the set, and we picked the best. Now, we have the advantage of knowing what the best is, right? So we're doing something, and this, the, the entire purpose of this exercise is to ask what heuristic could work, not what would a user actually do, because a user wasn't going to know what the best answer is. But what we want to do is give users the opportunity to use the tool that has the best chance of working. And so that's why we're starting here, and we'll work on some models to figure out what users will actually do next. Bless you. Um, so this champ thing is, that, so I'm going to go about that later. So um, what's our outcome going to look like? Our outcome, we're going to use the adjusted RAND index, and so the adjusted RAND index tells you how often two pairs of nodes are similarly classified. And it's a score that ranges from zero to one if the, uh, if the essentially, if your two partitions are no more related to each other than random noise, then this measure is going to come out to zero. If, the, if every pair that is classified the same in one partition is also classified the same in the next, and every pair that's classified different is also classified different, this thing will come out to be one. It's a really nice measure. Um, it turns out we also do this exact same thing using the mutual, um, uh, the normalized mutual information score. You get the same results, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so what does it look like? Yet another one of Moody's crazy graphs that has way too much information on it, um, but I can't help myself. So, um, so the way to read this plot is we have the level of signal um, within the network along the x-axis in each of these groups. We have the adjusted, or each of these subgraphs. We have the adjusted RAND index on the y index y index, and we have the different methods across the top. Um, then within the set, we have a weighted version and an unweighted version, and we have a skewed degree and a non-skewed degree. So the blue in this case is weighted, the red is unweighted, the weighted degree, so this is the, the case where the network has a, has a power law distribution, and this is where um, uh, it doesn't have a power law distribution. So just to give you an idea, what we see here is the edge between this method works crappily until you get up until about um, a, a, a two-thirds of the way up our level of noise signal to noise. So edge between this works really well at finding the solution when the solution is obvious. Um, but it doesn't do very well any other time. Whereas if we're looking at um, uh, the, and that's the true on the double nested graph, so that's the different graphs down the, the time. On the hidden graph, it's like it, you really have to be up here in the signal set for um, uh, edge between us to ever find the right answer. The constant pops model, you're going to get the wrong answer almost all the time if you just use the defaults. So that's what this is, is using the defaults. And so that's not there. If you use the defaults on the fast and greedy method, um, again, for these two graphs, you're not going to do very well. If you have the weighted graph on the simplest structure, you'll do all right. And it's similarly with this weak core, those are the two simplest structures. Um, it does OK. Um, but by and large, you can see that all of these methods, um, you know, the methods differ greatly in the stick to which they um, pull off the set. And more often than not, you're in these situations where you're not finding the right answer. Now, one of these stands out as different than the others. This is the Leiden suite method. This is um, where we said, let's go through and pick a resolution parameter from low to high and retain the one that matches the truth the best. And when you do that, across all levels of signal to noise compared to the others, it does a really good job. You end up finding the right spot. So if you know where to look in this resolution sweep, you can do a good job. But knowing where to look is hard to find. So we're going to get there in a minute. Um, what else to say about this? Um, some of the other, so th those are the direct optimization methods. By far the easiest um, graph to get the solution on is in this weak core. That's because we never change the amount of noise that we're sending to the graph as a whole. We just weaken the internal, the internal system. And when you do that, there's still enough signal there for the uh, rest of the world to find it. These are the process optimization and the eigenvector methods. And uh, it's a kind of a, a somewhat different story here in the sense that the process optimization methods, particularly um, the label propagation, info map, um, and fluid sweeps, they all do better than the direct optimization methods out of the box, just doing nothing else. And so that's kind of nice. The stochastic block models and the eigenvector methods tend to do pretty poorly. And this is a bit surprising because of all the ink being spilled on how important stochastic block models are. 
we really expected them to do much better. But in, in practice, the eigenvector methods work really well in theory if you have a really nice structure. But in these cases, you can see even out here where anybody with a pair of eyeballs would be able to tell you where the clusters are, the method can't find it. And so that's really a bad thing. So what I'm ta if you take nothing else away, don't use leading eigenvector. Right? There's better things out the box. So these are too many solutions to find. This is how often happens when you do Monte Carlo experiments. There's too many solutions to sort of just get by eyeballing it. So we come back to regression at the end of the day. And so what I've done here is this is, these are a, co a coefficient plot for a, um, a fit, a general linear model um, on the logistic scale because the independent variables between zero and one of the um, different features that are going into this Monte Carlo and its effect on uh, finding the right group. And so it's easiest to interpret here. This is our signal to noise thing. So if you have all your ties, you know, four and a half out of five of your ties going in group, you're gonna do a really good job at finding it. So you have a positive coefficient and as we get noisier, it's harder to find the right group. So that just helps you get a sense of what the scale is. It turns out that across all cases, the weighted graphs are easier to find than the unweighted graphs, and the, um, uh, the, skew, the more skewed the degree distribution, the less like, the harder it is for these community detection algorithms to work. Intuitively, this is because the star nodes end up pulling in all these branches, and the algorithms want to put their people they're tied to in the same group, but stars necessarily are gonna have more cross-group ties than not, so this is confounding for what the group is doing. Um, when you then look at this um, different, the different sort of features, the, the simplest um, sort of nested structure are the easiest to find. These different sized groups are a challenge. It's hard for the, the routine to figure out what to do when there's different sized groups. Of the different classes of methods, this resolution sweep method is um, far and away the best method. It sort of outperforms all the rest, controlling for everything else. If you don't know how to do a sweep and you can't figure out the right way to sweep, which is not your fault, is because it's actually ended up being a difficult thing to do. The next best thing is one of the, the process optimization methods. In particular, InfoMap, fluid communities, and label propagation. Fluid communities is a little bit tricky because that's a sweep, really. Um, but label propagation and InfoMap are out of the box, do a good job, just, just off the shelf. So if you have, again, second thing to remember, other than eigenvector methods are bad, is if you have to pick a method with nothing else to do, and you don't, you don't have the tools to do the sweep yet because you haven't downloaded Peter's package, then go to InfoMap. Right? And also, the second story is the structure of the network matters. And so there's a lot of variation in these coefficients by the underlying structure of the network. I'm not gonna go through that in great detail here, other than to point out that each of these methods um, you know, perform a little bit better in some graphs than others. And again, it's kind of remarkable how poorly um, uh, things like these edge betweenness or the leading eigenvector methods do on all of these methods. And um, with that, then I will stop, take some questions, and um, then turn it over to Peter. So, questions or thoughts? Oh. I should say that the next two, the next two parts of this project, just to let you know what we're doing, what's happening next, is um, where this result I think is is really easy to look past is this weighted feature. This is, we've weighted the edges simply by reciprocity. If you have any feature that should be a community enhancing feature, you think theoretically, like reciprocity, transitivity, homophily, right? You should be able to weight the graph by those features and that should increase the signal to noise. And so the next version of, the next part of this paper is going to um, really look at some of these alternative weighting schemes. We're gonna look at explicitly nested recovery schemes where you first try to get the big structure and then look within that structure. And then we're gonna talk about these guided sweep methods. All right, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks. Questions generally before Peter takes over? I guess I've given up all my time. I didn't mean to cut you off. All right, good. Stuff. He's loading I'm stuff up anyway, so. <laughs> Questions or thoughts? Fire hose Please. Dave. I think the main thing that's going on here is that they assume too much homogeneity. So they're only working, they really only work on internal cohesion and they're really only capturing the broad division. If you look into the qualitatively into where these methods go wrong, they all get fooled by the nested structure. So what they're all doing is they're returning that big wide two community solution, or if you're lucky, the four community solution, and they're not going down any further. 
So, but that's, and that's part of the reason why one of the things we're going to do next is look at these dedicated nested methods. Because it might be that doing two eigenvector switches, switches passes. You go back, let the eigenvector pull out the first set, and then within each of those, run it again, that maybe you'll get to the same spot. But um, out of the shelf, it's not working. Okay. Yeah, I have a question about your decision to take a network that reflects certain of the expectations we have of like the kinds of networks we're going to use. So people, yeah. in a setting. And, but not all of these methods were specifically built for those, right? So like, uh, there's some papers out there that look at clustering solutions for like URL links. So right. Like, Yeah, I think that's probably true. And so that, and that is a, a fair point, is that many of these methods have been designed to cluster graphs of millions of nodes um, and there's, that are much denser and have much higher average degrees than social networks do. Um, and so if you look at something, for example, like the GitHub you know, cross-posting network um, or one of the classic Twitter networks, these kind of networks will have a million nodes and a modularity score above 0.9, um, right? And so those things, you could literally throw any clustering algorithm in the world at them, and they're going to do a good job at that first top cut. Um, and for many of the applications that those users are doing, if your goal is just to figure out who's talking about cats and who's talking about politics, then that's perfectly fine. You really don't need to do much better than that. And the people who have you know, political jokes about cats are not that interesting to you anyway, and you don't care which side they go on. For us, we really care whether or not you put you know, Tom in the medical school or Tom in the sociology department. And so that distinction is going to matter a lot for the kinds of you know, resources he gets and the kind of decisions we make about the work that's happening. So I think as sociologists, we really care about getting the assignment right. And we were so disappointed to discover the solution we thought was getting this, uh, the, the, I was so disappointed that, uh, that the, we thought the solution we were getting right didn't actually work, but now we're going back to the drawing board to find it. But I think that the social process model is capturing exactly what we want. All right, Peter, take two. Do I, do I take the microphone from you? Yeah.